very much. Um, can I just thank the Assembly researchers for both organising this seminar and also um, kindly accepting the proposal that Bridget and myself put in to present today. I look out across the room and I see sort of at least half the people I recognise who are people who know an awful lot about the subject that we're going to talk about. And when Bridget and myself sort of set out to think about what we might talk about today, it wasn't so much about coming along with a series of proposals or solutions, because they've been on the table and been on the table for quite some time. But it was more to try and reflect on where we might be going to, what are some of the underpinning principles of what we're trying to achieve, and to look at what has happened in one other jurisdiction, England, to try and reflect on both the outworkings of some similar proposals uh, in that jurisdiction, but also some of the legal um, cases which have uh, been reported publicly uh, in recent times to see what learning we might extract from that and how that might help us uh, move forward uh, in this jurisdiction. Um, which has already said, children become looked after for a wide variety of reasons. And the majority are admitted to care for a complex, because of a complex interplay between their needs, which result in their vulnerabilities, and their parents' ability or inabilities to address those needs in ways which are deemed to be appropriate for the child uh, and seen appropriate by wider society. As the chair of the committee mentioned at the outset, um, since the introduction of the children order, as of the 31st of March last year, we had more children in the care of the state in Northern Ireland than at any other time. Um, a 14% increase over the past three years, with many children coming in for relatively short periods of time to do with a family crisis or a family actually asking for their child to be looked after because of their child's behaviour or needs that require some sort of response but also another grouping of children and young people who need looked after for a much longer period of time because actually their home situation with their parents uh, is at such a place that they are unable to be cared for. And as was mentioned already, in terms of reasons for why we've had this steady increase in recent years, whilst it's not fully clear as to why that might be, certainly the current economic recession has, is one significant factor in terms of the financial strain that that's put on some families, the lack of availability of resources that those families have access to, and also, if we're being truthful with ourselves, the lack of resources within public services to support some of those families. Alongside of that, we know that there's been a reaction to some very high-profile cases where children have died and where it's believed that the balance that has to be struck between the needs of children and the rights of parents hasn't been sort of worked out uh, appropriately and therefore that constantly professionals uh, across a wide range of disciplines need to relook at sort of where that dividing line is between trying to support vulnerable children at home with their families while it's also intervening and removing children who do need to be cared for in less risky situations. And obviously, as was mentioned, the constant reflecting upon whether or not in terms of the needs of older young people who are 16, 17 and 18, what are the state's responsibilities towards them um, in situations where their own home situations break down? Like was mentioned uh, a moment ago, uh, alongside this rising demand for children's social care, which is actually a success, more people are recognising the good that can be got through identifying vulnerable children, even with, with it, whether that's within their own families or within their own communities, and asking for help and the cost of providing those additional support services, especially if we want to move to a situation where we provide earlier, more timely support rather than waiting for things to get to uh, crisis. Um, but at the same time as we see this uh, rising demand for children's social services, we've also seen a 7% decrease in the financial resources available. And so that means that there's a very active discussion which is having to go on and be managed as to where are the thresholds for state intervention, both in providing support, but also in trying to determine how best to meet the needs of those children who do need to, uh, to be received into public care. When we talk about permanence, um, what we really seem to be talking about are three conjoined issues. Firstly, we're talking about the need to ensure that children have a, a safe and secure base from which to operate. Um, that's not just about their physical integrity, but it's also about their emotional and psychological well-being. Second to that, we also uh, are much better informed because of research and practice wisdom about the importance of creating stability for children. 
and that even if children do have to move caregivers, that it's really important that actually we try and minimise the number of changes of placement that children go through. And finally, the thing that we've probably become much more aware of recently, and it follows on from Alice's presentation, is children's need for a sense of identity and how we sort of then bring together those three concepts of identity, stability and security really sort of epitomises what we're trying to achieve through permanence. The Look After system actually works for a lot of children in the public care system, and I'll sort of debate that with anybody who would like to sort of argue otherwise later on. But we also know that there are some children and young people who don't have their needs met within the system, and those are the ones that we want to think about how do we sort of provide better for those uh, needs uh, when we take what are very draconian measures in actually saying that parents can't look after their children moving forward. But we also know that the system itself is under pressure. As was mentioned earlier on, there's a rising demand. We also know that some young people who are in the care system, particularly adolescents, where parents and families have asked for them to come into care, place an undue strain and demand on the, the system itself. But also that for many children and young people, we've had a, a tendency over the past 15 years to try and work with more of those vulnerable young children for longer at home. And for some of those children and young people, that's been very successful because actually the difficulties that their parents and families are experiencing have been ameliorated and those children have gone on to do very well. But we also know that actually there's some of the children and young people who are kept at home whenever the prospects of the situation that they're in improving is probably not uh, as strong. Uh, and therefore, by the time they do come into care, they've had to actually cope with much greater levels of adversity over a much longer period of time. And therefore, their needs are much more complex by the time they enter uh, the looked after system. And flowing from that, we also know that we have a system that is very busy. Uh, and that there has been a lot of concern about the delays within the actual court process itself. And a lot of useful work has been done by government departments, by researchers, and by those who are in commissioning and practice roles and trying to understand what are some of the reasons for why delay occurs and what can be done. So focusing on the first of those issues about um, trying to think about when should children come into care, one of the debates that's been taking place in Northern Ireland has been about this thing called early authoritative intervention, which is trying to think about how do we make right and proper timely decisions for children that are focused on their needs and how best to meet those needs, but also recognise that it's not just about what children need, it's about the difficulties that parents are experiencing, their ability to change some of the difficulties in their lives, and also to sustain those difficulties for the remainder of their children's childhood. And alongside that, it's not just about sort of expecting parents to change, it's about providing the right sorts of services that can help parents address the difficulties that they're experiencing in ways which are helpful to themselves and ultimately also helpful in their role as parents. In terms of delays in the court process, um, there's been very useful work done in Northern Ireland trying to identify what some of those difficulties are. But within the current access to justice proposals, one of the things that's been put forward is that we should be piloting in Northern Ireland uh, the, what has been done in England, the Triber experiment, which is looking at a very focused way of bringing together all the professionals who are very all committed to improving the situation of children and young people, but working together collectively to try and address some of the uh, delays that inevitably can creep into some court cases. Because there's a shared responsibility across professional disciplines to make the court process operate smoothly and also to operate fairly. Uh, and I'm a social worker by background, and one of the things that we have to accept is that it's quite right and proper that the state, through the judiciary, do challenge the assessments that we bring forward and that the assessments and recommendations that we bring forward to the court are robust and are defensible. And I think sort of uh, Bridget will sort of uh, elaborate upon that in terms of some English judgments. Finally, coming on before I hand over to Bridget, uh, one of the things is that sort of in terms of looking at adoption, there's a regular debate about sort of what is the right rate of adoption of children in the care system and do we have too few or too many? And if we look at the trend over a number, uh, I think this goes back to 2000, what we see is that the rate fluctuates 
from year to year, and that's understandable uh, why that might happen. But it also does mirror the actual pattern of children being received into the care system. But we also know that there's things which are going on within that in terms of the push that there was based on sort of research that came from colleagues in Queen's, Dominic McSherry and Kerry Lee Weatherall, I think, sort of came in a moment ago uh, in terms of sort of colleagues from Queen's who did research trying to understand why there may be delay um, in terms of some children being adopted and how much that was to do with our own cultural attitudes towards adoption as an option as opposed to the needs of children. But alongside that, there's a clear need for us actually to look at uh, what we want to achieve through adoption and how that is one route to permanence, but not the only one. I'm going to hand over to Bridget now. As John said, uh, I'm going to talk about England, where we have been looking at um, issues of delay and adoption, really in a very concerted way in the last six years, but actually the, we have had two big pieces of legislation. One uh, was 2002, and the last one was 2014. Now, when I say England, actually, some of what I'm going to be talking about also does apply very much to Wales. And in fact, recently, I don't know if people saw the... Um, uh, European Court uh, report, the Court of Europe, Central Court of Europe looked at uh, rates of adoption across Europe and particularly expressed concern about England and Wales because we are very unusual in Europe in having high levels of adoption from care and also high levels of adoption that dispense with parental consent. I mean, that's virtually unknown in a lot of the other European countries. So they just flagged up a warning uh, signal around that. But I am going to just talk about England in, in just because it makes it easier, because there are policy differences in terms of, say, family support in Wales. And uh, so anyway, it makes it easier if I just talk about England. Um, Okay, uh, before I move on to the Children and Families Act, let me just say that in terms of the debates in Northern Ireland, in, two th uh, in the late 90s, uh, Tony Blair became very influenced by Bill Clinton's work in the States and became very concerned about the numbers of kids who were if you like, drifting in the care system and uh, felt quite strongly that, lo that social workers and local authorities had rather rigid ideas about who was a suitable foster parent or, sorry, who was a suitable adopter. And he, th there was a kind of sense in which we were almost too politically correct and we were insisting on waiting for perfect matches, particularly transracially, actually, for children. And he, he felt that it was a very good way of achieving social justice and stopping kids uh, drifting through the care system or uh, not getting their needs met through a stable and permanent uh, ham ham family life. So the 2002 Act expanded the number of people who could adopt uh, and uh, opened it up to a whole variety of family forms, actually. Uh, and, but it also brought in something that we might mention, actually, and that you will be interested in, which is something that uh, you haven't got here, and I know that there is some appetite for. It also did bring in special guardianship. So it increased the potential pool of adoptees, promoted adoption as a legitimate and positive option from care for a wide variety of children and, adopt and adoptive parents, but it also did bring in special guardianship, which is another way of securing stability or permanence, if you like, for children that allows uh, a lot more contact with birth parents, etc. So we might want to come back to that, because I know that the impasse in your legislation is meaning that special guardianship is not available here, so you may want to talk about that. Okay, then the Children and Families Act. Uh, as I say, under Labour, there was a great deal of interest in uh, worry about delay, why was it taking so long in the courts? Uh, what could be done about it? And they did do quite a bit of work in the 2000s, uh, and they brought in something called the PLO, uh, Public Law Outline. Uh, and uh, that initially, it was brought in in 2008, I think, uh, and initially, sorry, 2006, and initially, definitely, it was about improving the quality of pre-proceedings work and actually stopping things going to court at all, if at all possible, uh, and actually keeping things kids more within family setups if possible and initially it did indeed stop the numbers of children and young people coming into the court in, and family in coming into uh, proceedings and court proceedings fell and there was a lot more emphasis on pre-proceedings however uh, the baby p 
tra tragic, tragic case had a massive impact upon the system. There's no doubt about it. And immediately, court proceedings started rising absolutely dramatically, which is also always something for us to uh, kind of ponder upon, that we can develop all these lovely policies and these policies that are based on evidence and these policies that are based on what we think is the right thing. And then public reaction and media outrage can throw us really seriously off course. Uh, and we're going through that again at the moment. So, um, with child sexual exploitation. So, um, anyway, uh, Labour did quite a bit on delay. They did uh, bring in, uh, they did try and pilot stuff around delay, and they brought in legislation to widen pools of adoption. And numbers did rise in the mid 2000s and then started to drop again. When the Conservatives got in, well, it's a coalition government, when they got in in 2010, the Minister for Education was uh, Michael Gove, who had a very strong personal commitment to adoption. He had been adopted himself. And he was very, very clear uh, that uh, there, was, there were too many barriers to adoption and that there was almost a, a, a kind of bias against adoption in the system. And so the Children and Families Act was brought in in 2014. Um, uh, it also tried to deal with this issue of delay. So it brought in this time limit of 26 weeks for court proceedings. That's not 26 weeks for adoption proceedings, it's 26 weeks for court proceedings. And uh, it's, it's expected that those cases should last 26 weeks, uh, but there is room for manoeuvre in exceptional cases. It's always asked why 26 weeks. There is no evidence-based rationale for this at all. It was just plucked out of the air. It's half a year. Uh, and um, it was, uh, as you can imagine, really people were very worried about it because you're right, the Triborough pilot had shown that it was possible with very good quality work and with people working together to achieve a reduction. For example, in 50% of the cases, 26 weeks was achieved, but in 50% of the other cases, it wasn't. So uh, this was a very challenging target for local authorities. It was also brought in in the context of massive austerity, huge cuts to uh, local authorities and uh, huge, uh, huge issues around family support services. So given that it's really crucial that you get into court with your pre-proceedings work done well, with having offered the family whatever is necessary to see if they can uh, look after their children safely, this was brought in in a very challenging time and probably the critics were absolutely correct to say this will end in tears because of course it has ended in tears. Um, the other thing that was brought in was the idea of promoting fostering for adoption. Very good impulse, I mean, incidentally, I think that we should try and reduce delay. I'm not in favour of long, drawn-out court proceedings, and uh, I think that. But I am a bit anxious about targets because they ha they haven't had a very good history in the English policy system. They've led to unintended consequences in all sorts of ways. The fostering for adoption, again, this was the thing about reducing moves because uh, one of the things that John and I have been talking about the last few days is one of the issues is really about uh, one of the things that really impacts pod outcomes is if kids have multiple moves uh, and, uh, and stability is really quite important. I'm not a big fan of the word permanence but I am a big fan of the word stability and, uh, and moves are really difficult. So, But it's had huge uh, legal implications, huge human rights implications because technically it was possible for a mother or a father to ask for their child to be accommodated under section 20 which is a the mother still uh, keeps all parental responsibility, so they were just accommodated. It was technically possible under the legislation for the social worker to think that mother is never going to get it together. We might as well make sure that we're starting to plan for this child so they could place in a foster to adopt placement and go all the road down with that. And at the time, uh, people were saying this goes against human rights legislation, it goes against the sec Article 8, it will be contested. And again, there, some of these, not this particular thing, but some of the the decisions that have been made in this rush have actually come back to haunt us. Um, the other thing was that it's not just that court proceedings are, expense, are lengthy, but they're also very expensive. And this was a context of really legal aid hasn't been stopped for uh, these kind of proceedings. But actually, there are loopholes. And there was a very tragic case recently where uh, parents with learning disabilities uh, ha ha got legal aid in terms of the court care proceedings. And then when there were, they wanted to vary something, uh, there was no legal aid available. And the father, who has learned, they both had learning disabilities, but he's always worked. And he actually had a monthly income of £714 
approximately, and he was just over the threshold for legal aid. And that's a loophole. So although they say, oh, we have given legal aid, there are bits where you're going back to vary things where legal aid is refused you. And actually, we're very lucky that legal professionals are working pro bono through the system now to make sure that there aren't terrible miscarriages of justice. And then the other thing that they uh, wanted to bring in was kind of stopping all this oversight, stopping expert witnesses, stopping uh, uh, judicial oversight. Uh, the issue, uh, briefly, on ex expert evidence. There were... It was really undermining of the role of the social worker often. There, were, there was lots and lots of people coming through the system uh, with expert, who were allegedly experts in this, that and the other. It was leading to very cumbersome and delay-filled delay uh, courts. But there are no good solutions in this area, as we'll see. If you take out expert witnesses, however, or expert uh, people, uh, the solution they came up with was that they would provide very good quality, up-to-date research evidence for judges and for legal personnel so that they could use their decisions. Well, that one has completely backfired because the first one piece of the first kind of briefing they did, the legal people rebelled because they didn't think the quality of the research was good enough. It's the evidence on neuroscience and the impact of uh, neglect on early brain in development. Uh, it was felt um, there was a really huge critique made of it, the uh, Brown and Ward work and the judges were very cross because judges don't like to be kind of they don't like to be talked down to like that. They don't like being given targets necessarily and they don't like necessarily being given poor quality evidence and then told to use it. So that's been a bit of a tricky one. Um, Okay, so, but, the leg but it broadly it is important to say though that most of the judges are in favour of 26 weeks and the cases I'm now going to go on and talk about which have really been quite tricky, uh, uh, Justice Mumby who has really been the central person on all these case law has actually said quite clearly I am in favour of 26 weeks but he has been making some judgments alongside his colleagues that have raised profoundly important issues for all of us and particularly for you if you're embarking on a legislative journey because he's actually saying to us we need to be really careful about adoption uh, about promoting adoption in a context of uh, dispensing with parental uh, consent and it's a very final step and we have to make sure that we have done everything possible to ensure that we have kept it, that we could have kept that child safely within their family of origin okay so uh, there's the re-b case where um, lady hale talked about it, it being the last resort uh, but the one I will talk most about is RBS, which actually was unsuccessful for the mother. The mother uh, wasn't actually contesting the adoption. She was contesting... Um let me just tell you what she was contesting. She was contesting the making... Sorry, she wasn't contesting the care orders. She, it was, she was contesting the making of adoption orders in relation to her two children on the grounds that she had turned her life around. She had, within two years from the care proceedings being made, the children being freed for adoption, uh, she had completely changed her life got rid of the abusive partner, married somebody else, had another child that another local authority had allowed her to keep, and she was now saying she wanted to uh, stop the adoption and she wanted to uh, bring, uh, she wanted to look after her children herself. Her, fi her, le her uh, application failed, but in the process, Justice Mumby made uh, a series of really statements that it is probably no exaggeration to, stay, to say stopped... Uh, things right in their tracks and uh, have uh, really things have not recovered for example just to give you a little indication because it's not just these three cases there's been a few more there's the re-a case which came up in darlington just a week or two ago which is really interesting we might have time to talk about that but quite literally i talked to a colleague in bradford the other day uh, where there are no children coming through for adoption in Bradford at the minute. Uh, there are a lot of parents still, ha potential adoptive parents hanging around. There are a lot of social workers who were uh, recruited to promote adoption and there are no children coming through. And it is partly because of these cases. And it's really interesting from a social work practice point of view to see what he said. Okay. He argued that... Um, he argued that the stay aim of statutory intervention should be to reunite children with their families if possible. An effort should be devoted to that end. Well, in a way, what he was really stating and what we'd been saying for a while about this, and I don't mean to be 
pejorative because I'm not anti-adoption either. But if, if forgive me by just saying the rush to adoption, the rush to adoption uh, by Michael Gove and Martin Neary, which put money into adoption, scored targeted uh, local authorities who weren't getting enough children adopted. And uh, we have been saying, be careful, be really careful with this. It, it is a disposal that's suitable for ch some children, but it is not what would seem to be being promoted, the gold standard because that leaves, well, how does that make other children feel? And there are other legitimate routes to permanence. According to the outcomes, there are other legitimate routes that can meet children's needs. And particularly, actually, one of the concerns we were act talking about, a lot about was the awful scenario where siblings were being broken up because one was suitable for adoption and the others weren't, weren't or because they were too old or whatever. Anyway, uh, what he argued was basically the 1989 Children Act still applied and the 2002 Adoption and Children Act still applied. And the ethos of this is that our first uh, impulse must be to make sure that we have really looked at the family and the family network and seen if this child can be kept safely within the family. And uh, he, Lady Hale went on in another case to say it's not just about looking at the current situation, it's also looking about what could be offered to make the situation situation safe and good for the child. So what support can you offer? This is very challenging in context of terrible cuts. I mean, the local authorities have had really very draconian cuts. But uh, So there are issues around how any of this can be done. But um, he was saying, he was restating some very basic principles. He was saying as well, the court must be satisfied that there is no practical way of the authorities or others providing the requisite assistance and support. Uh, judges have to be rigorous in exploring and probing local authority thinking in cases where there is any reason to suspect that resources might be the issue that's stopping. So where, pe where local authorities are thinking that mother with a learning difficulty is going to require family support for probably the rest of that child's life, uh, need to be a wee bit careful about putting forward those kind of, uh, uh, those kind of arguments in terms of resources. In ReBS, he also talked, which was quite painful. He talked about, which really sent shockwaves through the system, he talked about adoption being a last resort. He uh, talked about it when all else fails. Uh, to be made only in exceptional circumstances and where motivated by overriding requirements pertaining to the child's welfare, in short, where nothing else will do. Um, he also, and again, I just, I don't know how I'm doing for time actually. Okay, I just, he said that there were serious concerns as well, and this has come up really, really big time in the Rie case, the Darlington case recently, where a father uh, was able to get uh, care of his child and stop an adoption order as well. And uh, uh, the, the decision making and the assessments of the uh, family are really under scrutiny by the judges. And Mumby was saying, it's not because I've found the reasoning in this case bad, it's because I've noticed, and other judges have been saying to me in my capacity as president, that the reasoning isn't good. So you have to be really careful about facts, about hearsay. But crucially, in the ReBS case, he said, when you, you have to really do what he called a global holistic evaluation of the options. So it's not enough to say, mum has really bad problems, she can't do it. Dad has really bad problems, he can't do it. And kind of go down through the list in a linear way and then come to adoption. You actually have to do a much more ecological approach, which is where you're weighing up different options and you're looking at the possibilities in a much more interactive way. And you also always have to look at uh, adoption in, uh, look at it in a way, in a, a bit of a special case, because it is so draconian, because in the English system, not only can you dispense with consent, but it can't be reversed. Okay, so um, the ReBS, if you like, asserted a kind of family support probably pro-family emphasis that had run through the 1989 Children Act, you know, with its emphasis on partnership with parents, on uh, significant harm, and a height, a, a fresh, a, really keeping to a threshold of risk. And it really uh, kind of attacked, and certainly the RIA case, attacks a kind of climate where we're talking about future possible emotional harm, uh, you know, where things are a bit more fuzzy and we're making predictions on the basis of maybe past behaviour of parents. So it's opening up big challenges for us as social workers around not only what we assess, but how we make our assessments clear and really transparent. And that is a real challenge in particular parts of England at the minute where you've really 
big uh, shortages of social workers. It's not right through the system, but outer London, places like that, really big shortages of uh, social workers, huge reliance on agency staff, and crucially, you have had the closure of 800 short start centres. You don't have good quality family support because of cuts. So it's, it's, it's really quite a toxic situation, if you like, a perfect storm, as people would call it. And just very finally... I suppose one of the things that it's made me think, uh, observing, if you like, uh, as someone who isn't against adoption but has always worried about it being seen as the best thing, the only thing, and has really seen the uh, very good uh, outcomes of long-term good quality fostering, has also seen uh, in, the, in our system, and I know it's true in the in Northern Ireland context, I've seen really good outcomes from kinship care. It's not right for every child, but the outcomes of kinship care are extremely good. I've done a lot of research with kinship carers. I know how important support is to kinship carers, but it is a really good option for a lot of children. So it felt to me like one option was being singled out in a very ideological way. Uh, and the other thing is that as, as John mentioned, when we haven't done enough research on this, but we're doing a lot more research now on looking at the backgrounds of where children who are coming into care are coming from. And yes, it is about risk factors like substance misuse and uh, domestic abuse and mental health problems, but at the heart of it, at the heart of it is uh, that, that these children are coming from areas of deprivation. And so we do need to think about uh, kind of the social justice implications of removing children from very poor families and perhaps putting them with families with more resources, particularly if we're not able to provide compensatory uh, resources. So just really, uh, we need to have lots of discussions about... Uh, you know, if you look at special guardianship, it has been a bit of a success, but it also can be used as on the cheap. If you look at... Every option has its own problems. And so we need to be grown up about that and not assume that there is one perfect panacea. Um, there is, though, a quote now from judges that I really think should be very central to. We're not in the business of social engineering. As one of the judges, I think it was Lady Hale, said, uh, human beings are very frail. Lots of us get drunk on a Saturday night. Lots of us fall out with our partners. Lots of us are less than fantastic parents. That is not a good enough reason to take children away from their parents. And this was particularly apt in the case of a lad recently who had been in the English Defence League, who'd had a bit of a dodgy history in terms of his sexual activity, but where the judge said, this is social engineering. There is no evidence offered in this court report that this lad is going to be a risk to his baby son. And... Um, and he really reprimanded the social workers for their very negative and risk-laden approach to him. Um, yeah, I've already mentioned this. We need to think about the ethical and practical challenges of kind of rushing towards adoption if we haven't got the resources to support families to care safely. And finally, uh, you know, in England, we don't have uh, good forums for good, having good dialogue around this. We all get into our camps and we all start hurling kind of my way is best at you. And there's a lot of fear and shame in the English system as well, but I just want to leave you with uh, a message from young people. In an attempt to break that impasse a few years ago, when uh, uh, eight charities, BAF, the British Association for Adoption and Fostering, uh, the uh, Who Cares Trust, which tends to look after young people in care, in residential care, the Family Rights Group, which tends to look after the interests more of birth parents. In short, lots and lots of people who would come normally from different bits of the system got some money and got together and held an inquiry called Care Matters. And they, got, uh, they supported young people to have time during that inquiry to tell us what they wanted. And what they said, what they want, what they said to us was that we had built a system where they were constantly having to say goodbye to people. We'd built a system where, which built, broke relationships rather than helped them maintain relationships. So they talked about, you know, having been in foster care and then moving on and losing contact with a neighbour or the son of the foster parent. And they said to us, um, you know, our identities are messy already. Many of them had very mixed ethnic identities. These were London kids. And they said, we, we have past, present and future and we want you to provide systems that help us to keep a sense of identity across our past, presents and futures. Stop, stop de devising systems that mean that we're always saying goodbye to important people. So I think that that's an important lesson to hear from them as well. Okay, thank you.